So um, in this presentation, I will uh, share with you some cases I collected over the years to demonstrate common diagnostic pitfalls in breast uh, core biopsies. So at the end of the presentation, you will note that there is a theme. Uh, mostly cases can be mistaken as triple negative breast cancer as um, listed here. So let's start with the first case. Uh, this was from a 50-year-old woman with a breast mass detected on MRI. The patient had an MRI-guided core biopsy at the outside institution with a diagnosis of invasive carcinoma well differentiated. The patient came to our center for treatment. So this is the MRI-guided core biopsy of the lesion. I will show you several images at different magnification, give you a moment to review and come up with your diagnosis or differential diagnosis. So this is a low power view showing a infiltrative process. A higher magnification uh, showing some small glandular proliferation, infiltrating the stroma, some in the fat. And this is the higher, a high magnification showing the cytological details of the glands. So diagnosis. So this came with a diagnosis of invasive carcinoma. Indeed, the glandular proliferation does not have a peripheral myoepithelial layer surrounding the glands, but it is triple negative. Here's ER and PR with proper internal control. So if a diagnosis of invasive carcinoma is considered with this well-differentiated morphology and triple negative status, this is discordant. So we did more stains. The glands are surrounded by basement membrane highlighted by immunohistochemistry for laminin and collagen-4. This is laminin stain, and S100 is positive. So with this information, it is macroglandular adenosis, or MGA. It is a, well, uh, a rare glandular proliferation that can mimic invasive carcinoma. Patient age have a wide range. Patient may present uh, with a papal mass or screening detected abnormality or uh, incidental microscopic finding. MGA is composed of small round glands with bland cytology infiltrating the stroma, no stromal reaction. It has a single cuboidal, uh, a single layer of cuboidal epithelial cells, no myoepithelial cells. Uh, there's often secretions in the lumen, but it's not specific for the diagnosis. Different from ordinary or conventional adenosis, uh, they're usually uh, surrounded by myoptical cells. The glands in MGA does not have myoptical cells, but they are surrounded by basement membrane, which we use to confirm the diagnosis. It's triple negative, express S100. So in the next uh, hour or so, we're going to talk about uh, colitis and really focus on, on uh, how to stay out of trouble, uh, how to uh, help the gastroenterologist come to some um, to, to, to get them to narrow their differential. And, and pathology plays a really important role in colitis. And of course, we're going to spend some time talking about IBD and IBD and its mimics. So why, why do we care about colitis and inflammatory bowel disease? I think it's one of the most common specimens we get in GI pathology, colon biopsies, you know, roll out colitis, roll out um, IBD. Uh, and there's a lot of different things that can cause injury to the colon. There's an increasing prevalence of both IBD and non-IBD colitis. Um, colitis can significantly impact patient uh, quality of life. There's economic consequences. Um, and then as pathologists, we actually play a crit critical role in the diagnosis and management of colitis and just a, a few of the different types of colitis here that we'll talk about. So this is a really kind of busy uh, slide, and I, and I don't mean to, to go over this in, in great detail, but just to to give you a sense of maybe how you should approach colitis, um, you can think about these different things at the top and based on if, if this is the predominant feature, we'll spend most of the time talking about neutrophil predominant, but there's all these other uh, uh, sort of predominant patterns that, that you can see in the colon. And then based on the predominant histologic feature, you can um, generate a uh, most likely cause and then differential diagnoses. And again, this is a little bit busy. It's uh, a, a nice uh, review article uh, 
published a few years ago that I think kind of highlights the, the some of the challenges, but also helps you kind of figure out how to narrow things down when you do see a, a, a predominant pattern of injury. So how do I approach it in, uh, in kind of a day-to-day -day practice? And it's really a, a stepwise approach. I kind of look at things around 4x uh, initially, and that gives me a whole sense of like, okay, how many biopsy fragments am I looking at, right? Number one, don't want to miss one. And then does it look normal or near normal at low power? And if it does, then I know it's going to be a little bit hard, or at least if there's an abnormality, then it's going to be a little bit more challenging to see. Because at low power, still at 4x, you can see that there's that the, if it looks near normal, you know, it, it, you can tell between normal and abnormal at that power. If it looks near normal or normal, then I look a little bit harder at the lumen, the surface epithelium, look for apoptosis, that because that's not something you're going to see at low power. Look at the lamina propria and look to see if there's anything abnormal there. If it looks abnormal at low power, and what I mean by that is what we really see is increased density of, of lymphocytes and plasma cells in the lamina propria, then you divide it up into, does it have chronic injury or does it not have chronic injury? And that kind of leads you down uh, different pathways. And so this is kind of how I do it in my head. Uh, do that kind of low power and then normal, near normal. I have this to look for. If it's uh, abnormal, is it chronic mucosal injury or not? And then you go down this, this pathway. But of course, no single algorithm really can help you solve all cases. You really need to look at the clinical history, look at the endoscopy um, to really figure out uh, what's causing the injury. And often multiple patterns are present at the same time. I'm going to talk about kidney tumors to you today. Um, in terms of the flow of the talk, I'm just going to focus on how do we get to certain diagnoses for renal tumors just because the spectrum of renal neoplasia right now is kind of blowing up. It's become, it's become ridiculous. So I'm just going to focus on how do we get to a certain diagnosis and what are some features, you know, IHC, things that we could use to help us get to certain diagnoses. So what's new in kidney on the new WHO? The new WHO has blown up in the renal section. So RCC papillary type now is no longer typed as a type 1 or type 2 designation, so we do not utilize that subclassification anymore. So if you see a papillary RCC, we just call it RCC papillary type. Do not subtype type 1 or type 2. So that is the current recommendation. In terms of new entities that are recognized by the WHO, eosinophilic solid and cystic RCC, which actually was described by our group, is one of the newest recognized independent entities in the WHO, and I'm going to briefly touch on that today. In terms of categorization of other oncocytic tumors, we've got oncocytoma and chromophobe RCC-like features in terms of a category, and they've kind of opened the door up in terms of how do we classify oncocytic tumors overall, not just oncocytoma anymore. There's been talk about expanding that into oncocytic renal neoplasm, NOS, and, and some new emerging entities that have been talked about are low-grade oncocytic tumor, or LOT, and eosinophilic evacuated tumor, EVT. Now, this, these are kind of emerging entities currently and not um, essentially used in our clinical sign-out at this time, but probably will emerge as official entities down the line. In terms of papillary RCC spectrums, they've um, kind of given a nod to uh, emerging entities of the Warthin-like papillary RCC subtype and papillary renal neoplasm of reverse polarity. I will touch base on uh, the PRNRP subclassification in the papillary section of today's talk. And then the big change in terms of carcinoma versus tumor designation was the fact that now we call what we used to call clear cell papillary RCC is no longer recognized as a carcinoma entity. And we are now encouraged to call this a clear cell papillary renal cell tumor, just to um, note the fact that these tumors do not behave um, in an aggressive fashion. So they are essentially indolent. So the objectives today, we're going to start with approach to commonly encountered clear cell renal tumors, kind of the way I approach these differential in terms of making a diagnosis, review of the common diagnostic challenges in oncocytic renal neoplasia, 
kind of practical considerations when we're reporting out papillary renal tumors as well. And then finally, I want to touch base on common consultation cases that we see in terms of cystic renal neoplasia.